Hello everyone, and thanks for listening in. In the next few minutes I'm going to run through a pretty exciting demonstration of some things that we can do with the Curity Identity Server. In particular, I'm going to sh show you what prefix scopes are, or dynamic scopes. I'm going to show you how we can digitally sign an OAuth user consent. I'm going to talk about how we can obtain user attributes from a digital signing service and how we can assert those in ID tokens and access tokens. I'm going to talk about what claims providers are and give you a couple examples of those and I'm going to drive this scenario using OAuth well tools so I'll also show you some features of that application. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to begin by showing you the scenario and then the configuration that I had to do in Curity. I didn't have to write any code to do this but I did have to configure a few things so I'll show you what those are. First of all, in this scenario, we have a client application, which as I mentioned is OAuth tools. This is going to make a call out to some sort of transaction API or product API saying some sort of product that wants to be purchased uh, by the end user. That will return a transaction ID, uh, like a number one or two or whatever. And we're going to append that to a uh, prefix scope, which I'll explain in a little bit. And that uh, then will be sent in the normal OAuth authorization request. And after the user logs in, we're going to look up that transaction ID and the product API, and we're going to turn that into some uh, text that's going to be displayed to the user for them to sign the transaction. And we're going to send that text over to a digital signing service, which in my case is going to be bank ID, and the end user is going to open their signing application. They're going to see that text that we constructed, and they're going to sign the transaction. Once they do, Curity will notice that and issue an authorization code, which will redeem from uh, our tool to obtain an access token, an ID token, and a refresh token. We'll then use the access token to call some API, and in the API, uh, because the token is opaque, we'll introspect it and we'll get back their personal number and the transaction ID that was signed and then we'll be able to use that to thank them for their purchase by looking it up in the product API. Alright, let's see, look at the configuration that we have here. So here I am in the Curity Admin UI. I'm going to jump over to my OAuth profile where I've configured a consenter. A consenter is a um, uh, thing that can be configured that is used to uh, sign the interactive user consent. It can also be used for um, other sort of approval workflows, but typically you'll use this for digital signing. I've configured a bank ID consenter to do that, uh, s that signature of the transaction. So there's three things in here that are, are interesting. One is the bank ID client itself, which is going to do mutual TLS to uh, that web service. So all that's configured in this HTTP client with its connection pooling and caching and whatnot. I've also configured a web service here that's going to call over to our product API. And I do this uh, in here so that I can use this from this higher level uh, configuration script here uh, rather than having to, to do any of the low-level HTTP requests. Um, so in this script I get the list of scopes that are included in the request. One of them is the transaction ID scope uh, which is going to be a prefix scope and it, and it suffix so I want to remove the prefix part giving me just the transaction ID and I'm going to build this up into a query string um, that I'm going to use to call that web service that I just configured down here and once I get the response back, as long as it's uh, 200, I keep processing. I parse the response, which is JSON. And in there, if I have a product, I carry on by cr constructing that text, which is something along the lines of, do you want to allow this client to purchase some product for some amount in some currency? So this is the text that the end user will see during the user consent on the, the Curity OAuth server and also in their signing application. So the next thing I want to show you is a claims provider. So a claims provider is a thing that actually obtains attributes that Curity will assert into the different tokens. So I have the account manager, uh, which in my case is pointing to a skim server. This will obtain the profile data like their time zone and other things like that. Um, we have the consenter claims provider, which will get attributes from that digital signing service. And then I have a script claims provider, which will run a little snippet of code that will uh, similarly look through all the different scopes, find the, the uh, uh, transaction ID prefix scope, remove the prefix, and take the uh, suffix, which will be something like transaction ID number one or two or what have you, uh, and use that as the attribute that this one is providing.
so the next thing I have are the claims themselves. So a few that are interesting here is personal number. So this personal number is coming from the consenter claims provider. The attribute that uh, my bank ID digital signing service has is something called personal capital and number. I didn't like that, so I added a, a value transformer here that will get the personal number and then include it in personal underscore number claim. And this claim is being used uh, in the OpenID scope. And uh, so anytime an application requests that scope and an access token is issued, the personal number will be included in the access token. It's not included in the ID token and the user info. And that mapping to different uh, uh, syncs or different claim uh, tokens is only done for the default mapping, not for any client that's using this custom one mapper. And we also have the transaction ID uh, claim. So this one is also coming. Uh, from another source that we just looked at, which was the script claims provider. Here it's getting the transaction ID uh, from that script. We didn't have to transform the name. This is uh, claim will be asserted anytime the application requests the open ID scope or asks for this uh, claim in particular, and it will end up in the access token, not the ID token or the user info, and only when the default mapper is used. And then finally we have the name claim. So this one's coming from the consenter. So uh, my bank ID digital signing service will assert the name of the user after that signature is complete. And so we'll take that attribute and we'll include it in the access token, the ID token, and the user info uh, for these different mappers anytime the application asks for the account scope, the open ID scope, or the profile scope. Next, I want to show you the scopes themselves. So the most interesting one is this wildcard or prefix scope that we've been talking about here. This is transaction ID. It's marked as a prefix scope. So the application can uh, request this transaction ID and append any sort of prefix uh, or uh, suffix that it wants to. And so this helps to avoid scope explosion because then we don't have to statically configure our transaction ID 1, 2, 3, etc. We just provide uh, that unknown value at uh, runtime. And that's what the user authorizes is both the, the prefix and the, the suffix. So in our case, we even use that, that suffix part to look something up, uh, but we'll know each of those. And, uh, and that's why we're able to assert that using our, our script claims provider because the user will have authorized both the, the prefix uh, transaction ID and the actual suffix that the client application will append to that. And then lastly, we should look at the client application. So the one that I'll be working with is called client1. It has a name here which is what's going to show up in the uh, text assign. It can do different flows, including the code flow. It has access to the OpenID scope, which is going to get a few of those different claims, like the personal number. Uh, it also has access to the transaction ID prefix scope. It's using the default claims mapper, uh, which is going to put most of those claims into the uh, access token, but also the name into the ID token. We've configured here that we want interactive user consent to run, and we only want the consenters to run so that the the consent is, is digitally signed and it will be signed by the, the bank ID um, consenter. I also have my redirect set up here to work with OAuth tools. Okay, so that is the, um, the scenario, that's the configuration in Curity. So let's go ahead and, and do this. So here I am in OAuth tools. If you haven't used this before, you can think of of OAuth tools, kind of like the Postman for OAuth. I can do various flows with it, uh, and the one that I want to do is the code flow. So I've got an environment configured here, and uh, so I'll select from that uh, environment client one, because that's the one we just looked at. Uh, we want to do open ID so that we can get the the name uh, and the transaction ID and the personal number claims and we want to append a um, or we want to include also a the, the prefix scope but before we know the actual suffix value we need to create a product so let's make one here so we can say let's buy uh, a coffee and say that it's two dollars and and make that product so now we get transaction ID one so this is going to be the the suffix part so we can just say transaction ID, that's the prefix, and the suffix one. So we create that, and 
now we're going to do the code flow here. So the, f the first part of that, where we get redirected over to the OAuth server uh, to Curity. And this client application has three authenticate the authentication methods configured. So I'm, I'm given the choice of which one I want to use. I'll log in with username and password. And um, because I've logged in here before, it remembers my username, uh, John Doe, and then my password manager, my browser, fills in the password. So it's pretty, pretty good user experience to just log in easily. So now that I've logged in, I end up back on the authorization page where the user is actually authorizing this. And, uh, and because the consenter was configured, that's running. And that uh, text to display uh, script ran and it said do you want to allow client one the client name to purchase coffee which we just uh, created for two US dollars and it's asking me to open my signing application so I'll do that where I see the message again the same thing and I'll go ahead and uh, approve that transaction so I, I've logged in uh, I've signed that transaction security notices that it responds back with the authorization code uh, which we have here so we'll just redeem that so now we get back an access token, a refresh token, and an ID token. If we look inside of the ID token, we have that name here, which was provided by the um, consenter claims provider. So this is actually obtained from the, the banking ID digital signing service. And we have this opaque access token, which when we, we look inside of this by doing an introspection, we see that it has transaction ID 1. Uh, from the transaction script claims provider and we have the personal number which was put there by the uh, consenter claims provider and we have the, the name as well. So now we can actually use this to call an API. So let's grab this token, let's do another flow which is call external API and the API that we want to call is over here And the transaction that we authorized, if I remember right, was transaction one. We're going to do a get request, and we're going to take that token that we had and call this API. So then the API uh, sees the transaction ID and the personal number in the token uh, that we introspected, looks that up in the product API, and says, thanks for purchasing a coffee for two US dollars. So we can look again uh, at that scenario we had here. So the OAuth tools client uh, started a transaction. We did that with Postman, and we said we'd like to, to buy a coffee for $2. It gave us back a transaction ID. We appended that to our prefix scope. Um, there we, we logged in. Um, we looked up the transaction ID. We turned that into some text that was displayed on the uh, web page uh, hosted by Curity and also after the user opened their signing application they saw that same text and they authorized or signed their transaction and once that happened we got the authorization code back from Curity which we redeemed for the access token, the ID token, and the refresh token. We used the access token to call the API. It introspected that reference token and found the person number and the transaction number and it looked up the transaction information in the product API and uh, then thank the user for their purchase. So let's do that one more time just to, to look at it in, in more detail now that we have that familiarity with it. So we'll go ahead and create another product uh, purchase real quick. So we'll say we want to buy a movie. And we'll buy this for 200 Swedish kroner or SEK and get back a new transaction ID, which is transaction ID number two. So we'll start another code flow here using the same client. And we'll say, again, the open ID scope and transaction ID number two. So this open ID part is important because remember here, the scopes that we did, uh, open ID, uh, we have this one. So this one is actually containing the claims personal number and transaction ID. So if we don't ask for the open ID scope, we're not going to get those claims eventually. And just remember those claims, um, personal number, those are coming from the consenter and are only put in the access token. Okay, so it, it, they don't show up in the ID token. If we go back to our old flow here, we didn't see those uh, that personal number or the transaction ID in this ID token. 
Okay, so that's that's how that's happening is this this mapping here. So personal number isn't there, and also transaction ID has that that similar setup where transaction ID is only included in the access token because it's only needed by the API. So now we can jump back to this new flow that we were setting up here where we're using transaction ID number two. And what should happen at this point when we run the flow is that single sign-on should happen, but we should still have to sign this uh, particular transaction. So here it is, we looked it up. Do you want to allow client one to purchase a movie for 200 SEK? If so, open your, your signing application and authorize that transaction. So we see the same text here, and that's because Curity made a call over to the bank ID service with that text to sign. And then this application, uh, when it looks up at that digital signing service, it, it sees this text. So we go ahead and sign that transaction. And then the OAuth flow completes, and we get the authorization code again, and we redeem that, and we get a new access token, a uh, new refresh token, a new ID token. The ID token has the name in it, but not the personal number and not the transaction the transaction ID. And then we can use this to call the API. So let's call the API again. Um, so it's HTTPS dispenser security API. And then the product ID number that we got here was number two. So we can do like that. And this is a get request. And we take the token that we just got. And we should be able to call this. And so now it will look up using the um, transaction ID that's in that opaque reference. So this reference D3 whatever does not have the actual information in it. Um, so here we have D3. If we introspect this uh, real quick, we can see this. So if we introspect this, we see the values that it has. It has transaction ID number two. So it uses that to look it up in the uh, product API. And that's how it can create this, this message. If we changed this to number one, I also did some authorization in my API where it's going to see that um, the transaction ID that was actually um, associated with this token wasn't for transaction ID number one. Uh, so I get a 401 access denied. So that's a little bit about how we can use Curity to solve this uh, scenario where we have um, digital signing of the authorization request, how we can configure different claims providers to uh, get information from those digital signing services, and uh, how we can use prefix scopes um, to create dynamic uh, or wildcard scopes and avoid uh, an explosion of the number of them, and uh, how we can tie that to a client and go through this, this different flow. I hope that was helpful to you, and uh, if it sparked any questions or thoughts, please be sure and let us know. Thanks.